Just before we go across, just a couple of words of caution. Whenever you're within the ring road there, the helmet must stay on. Okay. It's not because we think the dish will collapse on you. It's more things might drop off. Tools or cricket balls or anything we leave up there when we're playing. Sorry, when we're working <laughs> up there. Hello flying friends and welcome to another video, something a little bit special today. I'm really excited to bring this to you. This is my video of the in-depth tour that I was given both around and in and on the dish, the Park CSIRO radio telescope in New South Wales. Now a couple of weeks ago I did a solo IFR flight over seven days from Moorabbin in Victoria all the way up to Longreach, the home of Qantas, and back again. And the first leg of that trip was from Moorabbin to Parks in New South Wales where I stayed overnight. And the reason for this was because I really wanted to check out the dish. So I spoke to the guys at CSIRO and I asked them if I could have a bit of time interviewing someone, to which they said yes. I talked to a guy called John. So thanks to to parks, the world saw the, the moonwalk with the greatest possible clarity. Such a fantastic event, 600 million people, one fifth of mankind at the time were, were watching it. It was fascinating, I've linked to it above here as well, and we really went into detail about the Apollo 11 moon landings and the role that the dish in parks had to play in that. But at the end of the interview, I kind of thought that was it, shook John's hand, we'd all go home, but he actually turned to me and said, well, would you like a closer look? To which I said, of course. But what I didn't realise was exactly how close he meant. And this is John and I walking up towards it. And my first question to him was, why parks? Why build something like this in the middle of country New South Wales, miles from anywhere? The telescopes need to be in very remote locations as a result. You can think of it as, as the radio equivalent of light pollution in optical astronomy. Mm. You wouldn't build a large telescope, optical tele in the middle of a, a large city, because you'd never see the faint stars. It'd be <laughs> blown away by all the light pollution. So likewise with... Um, radio telescopes, you want to build them in lo remote location so that the radio interference generated by the electronic equipment and the appliances don't overwhelm the really faint signals we're trying to detect. Are you able to tell if there's interference locally? Oh here? yeah, we so can see, see it. See. Yeah, yeah, we can see them. So we go, and usually it's someone with their mobile phone or <laughs> or, or something, and um, we just ask them to turn it off. Um, yeah. We have signs on the road asking people to switch things off, so but sometimes they ignore it. And so, uh, it's a problem we didn't have 15 it. years ago, I suppose. Now, before we go in, this is a great spot just to stop and look straight up, because you get a sense of the scale of the structure oh. here. So, um, so you can see just how, how massive it is, literally. Um, we'll go up to the track up there shortly. So what we're observing at the moment is the Breakthrough Listen project, which is a search for extraterrestrial intelligence. The five-year project, so there's another four years to go, and they're hoping that sometime in, in the next next four years or so, they will find a signal that is of intelligent origin outside the Earth. You know? It's one of several observatories around the world. The other one is at Green Bank. Uh, it's a 100-metre telescope at, um, in West Virginia. It scans the Northern Hemisphere, and mm. um, we do the Southern Hemisphere, and they're also using other radio telescopes um, for more targeted searches and also optical telescopes looking for laser flashes from the civilization if they exist. So <laughs> it's a pretty comprehensive project. I think the chances of finding something are, are, are very small, but the consequences are enormous. Mm. And so, uh, you know, we that's why we think it's a worthwhile project. If something is found, it'll totally change our understanding of not just the universe, but our place within it. Is there a protocol for if you find something the, the, the chain of events that have to happen after that to obviously yeah, I mean, the only, the only Well, if they do find a, a signal, they, it has to be verified from mm. some, with another observer to make sure it's not some local interference that they found. Mm. But once that's that's been it's been confirmed, they're just going to tell everyone because it's you can't keep something like that quiet. There's too many people involved. <laughs> it's going to leak out anyway, so don't even bother. If they find something, it's, it has to be confirmed by another observatory. And then once that's confirmed, they'll just tell everyone. I can't wait for the moment when you guys tell us that there is, you know, well, confirm that there's something else goodness. out there. Because I mean, you're not the only one. I can't wait my either. It'll be really <laughs> great, you know. Um, yeah. But if something is to be found, this project is so comprehensive, it, it, will, be, it will be found. <laughs> well, this is what we refer to as the old control room. This is where the control room used to be before we moved everything downstairs. 
The old desk with the globe and the dials that was depicted in the film. The dish used to be located about there. So the way the telescope works is pretty straightforward. You have the radio waves coming down from the stars yep. and they're reflected off the parabolic dish surface and brought to the focus where the radio waves are concentrated. The radio detector there converts the radio waves into electrical impulses. We pre-amplify the signals upstairs, then send them down some cables along one of the supporting legs. Those cables then work their way down through the central column and then emerge out here. And then through various chains, we can amplify the signal several thousand million times. We digitize it, store it onto disk, and then ship it around the world or transport it around the world via our fiber optic lines. And the reason we have to do this is because the signal we're trying to detect is so incredibly weak, it's difficult to appreciate just how weak the signal is. But perhaps the best way I can demonstrate it is by using this high-tech demonstration device, <laughs> otherwise referred to as a, as a feather. But if I was to release the feather and let it slowly drift to the floor, the energy that feather expended when it struck the floor was more than all the energy ever collected by every radio telescope ever built in terms of the astronomical data. And so that's why radio telescopes have to be so large. Because you want as large a collecting area as possible to collect enough of that feeble energy so that you have enough, enough signal to be able to analyze and study. We have a one gigabit per second fiber line, but it's upgradable to 10, but we have capacity to go to 60 gigabits per second if we have. Because the data volume is incredible. We can collect several terabytes of data every day, which we then have yeah. to ship around or transport around the world. This is what we use to, to move the telescope around. At the moment, it's on computer control, which means that um, people off-site can take, take, take control and move the telescope. But if I was to put it on MCP and local, I can move it up and down, left to right, using the dial. But this is what we use when we're stowing and unstowing the telescope, moving it for maintenance or stowing in motion pictures or anything else like that. <laughs> now, we're going to go upstairs. You're not uncomfortable with... Oh, you're a pilot. You're fine. level here is what we call the azimuth track level and you can see that in the center there's nothing actually holding it down it's just the sheer weight of the structure keeping it all is that right wow. uh, so everything from this level on up weighs a thousand tons <laughs> it's very very finely balanced which means we don't need big motors to move it up and down so, so, so we have two motors one there one opposite and the size of washing machine motors and inside the gearboxes, corresponding gearboxes, there's a 40,001 gear ratio. So we can move it up and down very easily. The whirring sounds you're hearing is the oil pumps constantly pumping lubricating oil through the gearboxes so that the gears don't seize. Okay. And you'll see this ring of mountains to the east there. And those hills, the Harvey Ranges, here we go, you can see the telescope moving. That's <laughs> Do you have any problems these days with anyone flying drones nearby? Because I know with the popularity of those these yes, days. Um, well, we haven't had anyone violating our, our area here. Mm. But again, they have to abide by the, 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 the civil aviation rules and, and, yes. and so on. It was about here that the, in the film The Dish, the elderly director stopped at the beginning of the film where the overzealous staff member doesn't recognise the old director. <laughs> um, and you can see him standing there looking up at the dish like that. So. <laughs> I don't want to leave, it's too much fun here. I don't mind about the snakes. I haven't seen any snakes, there's probably no snakes. Went to the gift shop. What a brilliant day, what a fascinating place. I hope you enjoyed that as much as I did. I really, really enjoyed meeting everyone here and geeking out with the technology. Awesome.